I wanted to be able to see you because I want to start by just asking you as you're able to take to stand up. You probably are grateful for this. <laughs> uh, and we're just going to sing just for a minute. You've, some of you have sung this with me before. It's a Sufi prayer. Uh, it has three words, open my heart. Uh, there's actually three lines, but we're only going to do one uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, Ana Hernandez, the wonderful Ana Hernandez, turned the Sufi prayer into a chant, and um, we're, I'm inviting you to sing it with me. Open my heart, 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 open my heart. One more chant. Open my heart, open my heart, amen. Thank you, beautiful. I can teach you the other two lines another time. I uh, chose this little picture to begin. Uh, this is uh, two beautiful icons, contemporary icons, as you can tell, uh, of Julian of Norwich and Martin Luther King Jr. And they, those two poles of life really uh, describe my sacred journey, my life. Uh, but I wanted to really begin by giving you a little picture of what uh, a bishop does in the Episcopal Church besides get arrested for protesting the Iraq War and making the Roman Catholic Archbishop angry and all those things that I do that you so kindly linked me to the great uh, Jim Pike about um, and, the, and the, my other predecessors who were also great. Um, I uh, go around every Sunday to not Grace Cathedral. I'm only there on, on the big feasts of Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. and. I'm usually in one of the little tiny California congregations. It's the most secular part of the United States, along with um, some parts of the Northwest and Maine. I don't know about the Maine. I don't understand that. But, um, <laughs> but you understand that it's a very secular part of the world there. And, and there's these fa very faithful, beautiful, beautiful people who go to church. And I go to congregations of 30 to 40, maybe 150 is a larger one every Sunday, and often I confirm people, which is a right in the Episcopal Church where people make a, a decision about being part of the community in a new way of, of confirming their faith in which they were baptized mostly as, as infants. And I meet with them before I uh, confirm them. So about an hour before the service, I meet with these folks. They're, the target age for confirmation seems to be about 14. And then, but then there are all these other people uh, whom, whom I also confirm who are in their, in their middle ages or their young adulthood or sometimes in extreme old age. Uh, I've confirmed a man who was two months from his death by cancer at age 78 and he wanted to be confirmed. And every time I do this, and this story is actually about you, Every time I meet with these folks, I, um, I set it up. I, I do the same thing. I never preach the same sermon, but I always set up confirmation in the same way. I tell the story about a young Spanish nun in the fourth century who made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem from Spain. Think of that. And uh, what, how arduous that would be. And she arrived during Lent uh, in that year and she witnessed uh, the Easter vigil. She took part in it the night before Easter Day. And, um, and she wrote a journal. And we still have this journal. 
from all those centuries ago. It's just amazing to me. And what you learn in this journal is that uh, confirmation was part of the baptismal rite that was done in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it was all about dying and being reborn. That's what it was all about. And it wasn't actually about the death of this, your body. It was the death of, of patterns of life that no longer worked for you or which never worked for you. It was about letting go of those so that God could give you a new life. So I tell them this, and then I say, that was all so you can tell me why you're here. And the most amazing stories pour forth from these young, older, and old lives. Every time, I have never not heard a story that I'm, for which I'm so grateful that I'm glad I'm sitting down when I hear it because I'm astounded by them. And that's what I've heard from you. I've heard you, these public narratives which have been so amazing, and we might thank them once again. <laughs> so amazing. And yesterday as well, but also I've, I've listened to the artist whose art is out in the lobby here tell the most amazing story to me about why she painted that picture of Jesus with three women and what her story, life in Iraq was like. And I've listened to volunteers who work here at the center. Incredible. It's the same thing. So sacred journeys, may I just say that you're on one if you want to be. It's all about intentionality and consciousness. You simply have to imagine that you are on a sacred journey and wish to put one step in front of the other with an openness to the new, and you're on a sacred journey. That, that's the whole secret of it, as far as I can tell. Um, so, you know, this question, why did I get here, to tell you my sake, a bit of my sacred journey is probably to do with all this activism I do. Um, and I wondered, I asked myself the question, why do I? What impels me? So what came to mind uh, was a story about my mom. Uh, so my mother is 91 this spring. She uh, is in North Carolina. She was a North Carolina farm girl, um, Methodist, United Methodist. And when I was Bishop Suffragan, um, right, uh, <laughs> uh, in Alabama, we had the Diocese Convention, a big gathering of everyone uh, to, to celebrate our community and to make some decisions together. We do it every year in the Episcopal Church, each diocese. Uh, we're driving home, it was exhausting. We had buried uh, one of my predecessors, uh, a person we really loved a lot, quite emotional, and I got a cell phone call that my mother had had a mitral valve failure they had rushed her to the hospital. It was my sister calling me, and she said, you have to drive here now. They don't think she's going to live. So I'm driving. Uh, my wife, Sheila, was imploring me not to drive because I'm weeping and not seeing the road very well. And I'm trying to think about all kinds of things about if I lost my mother in this time when I couldn't say goodbye to her and couldn't kind of have the final conversation I would have wanted to have with her. And I said, you know, Sheila, mom has read the Bible every day of her life since she could read. And I don't know what the favorite part, her favorite part of the Bible is. I don't know what the core teaching, the sacred center of, these, of this sacred text is for her. Then the, then the surgeon called and said, you know, we've gotten her into surgery, um, and, but we don't think she's, it's very unlikely that she'll survive the surgery. And she did, and we got there, and then they said, well, she's in recovery, we don't think she's going to survive that. Um, she's tough. Um, <laughs> and she did, and so our family, our daughters and Sheila and I and some other members of the family are gathered around her bed when they felt she was recovered sufficiently to remove the breathing tube that was helping her, and I asked the question. The first thing I did, it just poured out of me, I said, What's your favorite part of the Bible? And what she said was this immediately. And I realized, um, 
that's why. That's why I am who I am. Because uh, she taught me that this was the most important thing in the world, was to do justice and to love mercy and walk humbly, just as important as the other two, uh, with our God. So um, that, that's uh, really key for me. Um, I've also been learning lots over, over the last 20 years about um, how to tell our story, our story as people of faith in new ways. Because so many people don't have the language. When I meet with vestries of the Episcopal Church, Episcopal, Rector, Eucharist, Vestry, we speak in a foreign language. Uh. Nobody knows what we're saying at all. I mean, it's Greek or Latin or something else. It's not Sanskrit, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I tell them, you know, find a new way to say this. Find a new way to say this. And one of the things you and I have been learning is that there's a new way to tell the story of everything. And it's the, you know, we used to call it when I was a little boy, the Big Bang. Or now it's the Great Flaring Forth. You probably don't feel very affectionate towards the Great Flaring Forth, the Big Bang. You don't get warm feelings about that, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, Adam and Eve, you might have some good feelings or bad about that. But, you know, the divine parents, the early parents, you might have some feelings about that. But let me suggest something to you. If you can think of one person who poured out her life for you, or one man who poured out his life for you, that is, a teacher, a parent, somebody who loved you enough to pour out the content of their life so that you could live better. Can, raise your hand if you can think of such a person. Then you're thinking of the great fireball. Everything in the universe came forth from that, from that. That is everything, including love. Love was implicit and contained and completely within the fireball. It was shot through with love, as Brian Swim says. And I would add, there was something behind it. There was not nothing behind it. It came from love. So everything that is love in your life and mine is like that. It comes forth from that. So what you're seeing on the left is something that we start, I started in California two years ago called eco-confirmation. And can you see a, a scarlet spiral on the ground? That's a scarlet rope. It's, this, it's proportional to the length of the 14 and a half billion year history of the universe. And it has abalone shells at points along it. And this wonderful dancer from the Philippines took water that I had blessed in the center, and that represented the great flaring forth of everything that is, space and time, you and me. And as we read, as a woman read, the history of the universe, the beginning of galaxies, the beginning of sexual reproduction, the beginning of human life, she would dance her way to a different abalone shell and pour this beautiful water into it. Everything you could see, I didn't have to preach a sermon, came forth from that, from that. Isn't that beautiful? So, so there is uh, the spiral, uh, our galaxy, uh, just to remind you of this spiral movement. And my life, I have seen, is a life of, uh, I heard Gray Henry say this this morning, so beautiful, where is Gray? this morning, uh, compression and expansion. It is all compression and expansion. That is, we get intimate with something, suffering, uh, beauty, love, and then we expand from that into something of meaning and uh, a larger life, and then that propels us forward. That's the movement of the spiral. We're all moving that way, and I see my life has been moving that way. That is the shape of it. So I had a teacher, a spiritual teacher, who taught me one way of praying was to pray with my teachers. So I do that, and it's one of my practices. He said, summon your immediate teachers to be present with you. So I do that. I, I pray and I bring them to mind. Uh, Charlie Price, my theology professor at Virginia Seminary, um, the, the woman and man who, when I was very little, who took my sister and me walking in the woods and taught us to appreciate and name 
the plants and animals in the hills of Tennessee. All these people, uh, are the immediate teachers, I bring them to mind. Uh, then he said, bring your teacher's teachers to mind. Bring them present to you. So uh, then you go on back. So this is a practice I do. Also, I came to understand that place is a teacher. The land is a teacher. Where we were, what we're made of. I, you and I are made of the land on which we live. So that's a teacher. That's where I was born, the Atomic City, oh. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, part of the Manhattan Project. The other parts, the big other part was Los Alamos. We did all the nuclear reactor work. They did the bomb testing. This is a strange place to be, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the Atomic City. That, that's some of the nuclear plants on the right. My father uh, worked there after World War II. He was not part of building the bomb, but the nuclear work went on. My godfathers, my, all the parents of my best friends were the people who were the physicists, the chemists, and the engineers who built the atomic bombs. It's a morally ambiguous place to be a child. It's still an, among the top five targets if we were under nuclear attack. In the 9-11 attack, I was outside of Notre Dame University in a taxi trying to get back to the East Coast, and we heard the news of the attack, and 20 minutes afterwards, the next bulletin said, Oak, it listed the places that had been shut down in terms of security, Oak Ridge was one of them. This is the place I grew up in. It's in the hills of East Tennessee, not so far from here. Incredibly beautiful. And it hides an incredible moral ambigu ambiguity and toxicity. 900,000 tons of mercury are unaccounted for. Unaccounted for. Um, it's a heavy metal. You know where it is. It's in the bottom of the Tennessee River and the Clinch River. Uh, it's in our bodies, those of us who grew up there. My father died when I was 14. It was a blow. Uh, it was a blow that it has taken me many decades to even begin to really absorb and understand. It shaped me. Decades later, I learned that he, his cancer was caused by radiation exposure. There, it's over 300% more likely that those of us born in the atomic city will develop cancer than any of you. It's a dangerous place to have been born. So it shaped me. It's my teacher. It taught me about the fragility of the life that we live. It also taught me about the beauty of the earth and how committed you and I must be to this planet on which we live and how we have misused it and made disastrous choices for the planet and for each other. It was my teacher. Th that could well have been me. The Atomic City welcomes you. <laughs> they used to have security signs uh, that were seasonal. Uh, Santa Claus would be going like this. <laughs> Don't tell secrets. We need to learn to tell all kinds of secrets and be transparent. It's the word of our time. I have other teachers that I summon to mind. And remember, we're choosing those. I choose which ones to summon to mind. Um, this little guy, Thomas Andrus, was 12 years old in 1620 in London. He was an orphan. He was kidnapped by the Virginia Company <coughs> and shipped with 99 other children to Jamestown to work as an indentured servant. May I say our family has been poor for 400 years. <laughs> It's, that's how we started. But I thought about him a lot. I summoned Thomas Andrus into my consciousness to think about this 12-year-old coming to Virginia, not knowing what this country would be, but also he might well have died if he had stayed in London, a dangerous city for a 12-year-old orphan. And so maybe it saved him. And certainly he was strong because 70% of those children in 1619 and 1620 died within one year. So he lived. 
And I think about his life and his courage and, and God's blessing on him. Underneath him is Daniel Deans in my mother's family. And uh, Daniel was a Methodist in the 1780s and fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, all of my mother's ancestors who fought in the Revolutionary War were Methodists. And it's interesting because they were, it's probably why they fought against England. They were not part of the Church of England, not part of the church I'm part of now. And I, I think about him because of his humility and his ardor for God. And, uh, and his, his humility and his ardor set my family on a path which resulted in my mother saying, to love justice, do mercy, and walk humbly with your God. It was, so I summon Daniel Deans and Thomas Andrus when I, when I summon my teachers. I'm just going to tell you all, I've had extraordinary exper experiences of God, and almost all of them have been of the feminine divine. God as Our Lady. Uh, the, this is, I'm not going to tell you these stories. Um, they are quite profound and personal. And as William James said, mystic experiences can only be certified to the person who's had them. You can't prove them to anyone else. But they have been real to me and always in this profound sense of the feminine divine. But if you want to read a great story of a person who had an experience of the feminine divine, get Olympia Dukakis's autobiography. I got it by accident. When I was uh, Bishop Suffragan of Alabama, it's a big diocese and I drove a lot. So I subscribed to something that would give me CDs to listen to. And by accident, they sent me Olympia Dukakis's and I was pretty angry about that. I was like, <laughs> I do not want to listen to Olympia Dukakis's, but I didn't have anything else to listen to. It's an extraordinary story of uh, how, how God came to her as the feminine divine this Greek woman who was raised in a patriarchal Greek family, and, and God came to her first on the massage table as the feminine divine and said, I love you. And she, the, she started weeping, and she, the <laughs> massage therapist noticed something was wrong and uh, <laughs> said, what is this? And, and she told her. And then two weeks later, she went from her home in Montclair, New Jersey, to New York by train, and she got out on the platform, and God, as the feminine divine, came to her again and said, I love them all. I love them all. That's been my experience. And her story is quite interesting anyway, so you, you might read it or listen to it. So Our Lady has been a great teacher to me. Christ has been a great teacher to me all my life. I have been devoted to Jesus the Christ. And um, I love this, this painting that comes from the Carolinian period, of uh, Aachen. Uh, do you see the cosmic swirl on his belly? That's crazy, uh, <laughs> but, um, but beautiful. And uh, this is a, a, a picture of Christ, not the only one, that expresses the beauty of this um, very personal and very universal spirit to whom I have been related. Do you see God in this picture? Raise your hand if you see God. Where is God? Burning bush. Burning bush and? Yeah, this is the... Now, all the icons that you see where God the Father is depicted, you should throw them away. <laughs> Uspensky, who was referred to earlier, I, was it Gerardo? Uspinski and Lasky, great, great scholars of uh, icons, said uh, the true icon never shows God the source of all being. It's own, that's the merest attempt that you should show. And that is the unknown God to me. That's the third part of this trinity. Our Lady, the Feminine Divine, the Holy Spirit, Sophia, Christ the Savior, and the God who is the source of all being. It's not the fireball. It's that from which the fireball came. And that is love. Um, when Sheila and I were graduate students at Virginia Tech, 
we had friends, we were in a prayer group together, and we heard that this man, Basil Pennington, who was a Cistercian, was going to be speaking at Catholic University. And we drove from Blacksburg, Virginia, all the way up there, and we heard this man talk about something that was called Centering Prayer, that he and Thomas Keating were reintroducing to the West. Prayer of quiet, prayer of silence. I also used the Jesus prayer within that silence as a mantra. Uh, Basil taught me to love silence and to incorporate it in my prayer life. And all these courageous things that I've been able to do, and some of them have taken courage for me, as they take courage for you in your lives, they come out of the silence in which God speaks to me. I'm so grateful for this gift of how to pray in, in that way. Uh, I use a Lectio Divina method uh, that Thomas Merton used that we were introduced to yesterday uh, in sacred practices in the morning. And uh, the silence is folded into that. And those are the steps that I use. And I'll just like, let you look at them for just a second. So finally, um, finally, I learned Greek when I was at uh, Virginia Seminary. And it was a pretty funny, strange process because I was, um, I was terrified at the first Greek class. And I couldn't explain why. I was, I was sweating. I was gripping the, f I'm, I was an adult. I was a young adult. Uh, <laughs> but I was so frightened in this language class and I realized uh, that when my father had died, when I was 14, it was when I first started taking another foreign language, uh, a classical language, Latin. And I had a miserable time that year. I mean, everything was wrong. I failed, I was, I, you can probably tell, I was a good student. <laughs> um, and I failed both algebra and Latin. And this, taking Greek, frightened me so much because it reminded me of, of that. But I overcame it once I understood the source of it, I considered it a chance to go back and visit that and, and make it better. So I fell in love with the Greek language and the Bible in Greek. So Jesus' words in Greek became part of my prayer practice. So every morning, I read a fragment of the gospel in Greek. And may I say, everyone should read another language or speak another language. Everyone should speak another language. We should all learn Spanish. We should all learn French. We should all learn a classical language. Because as the great New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd said, when you learn another language, you have access to another world. That's completely true. It's completely true. So I put this little fragment up here because what happened, one day I'm reading the Greek New Testament. This comes from the Gospel of John. And um, this is not how you will read any English translation of this. Most of them say, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people, mostly in the old version, all men, to myself. I noticed at the bottom of the page in the Greek New Testament a little note that said in a second century, very ancient fragment of the gospel, it said all things, not all people. And that was a clue to me that that was the earliest version of that verse. Uh, so uh, now this is how I say it. And this is Christ reconciling all things, the planet, you and me, all of our brokenness together. Uh, so this has been uh, a practice that, that is part of my spiritual journey. Um, I'm giving you a, 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 beautiful, a beautiful quotation from the wonderful uh, late Potter writer um, essayist M.C. Richards, which I go back to a lot, but someone within me is resolute, and I try again. Within us lives a merciful being who helps us to our feet however many times we fall. That has been my reality. I have always found that there is a divine presence within, just as there is outside of me as well. And that's the next part, also from her. 
when the sense of life in the individual is in touch with the life power of the universe, he senses himself as potentially whole, and he senses all his struggles as efforts towards wholeness. Uh, these are questions for you. Thank you very much.